A very warm welcome to our recorded version of our service for the 15th of May 2022. Uh, I'm standing in for Pete, although Peter Groom will be leading the service uh, in person on the 15th. Just a couple of uh, notices, just a reminder that after the church service, there is a church meeting straight up, well, not straight after the service, but after you've had time to have a cup of coffee and uh, talk to people, and then we'll be starting the church meeting. Also a reminder that uh, the Christian Aid Collection is taking place again in front of Roy's, or outside of Roy's, uh, on the 21st of May. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the back of the church. If you're not able to sign, but you'd still like to be part, could you let Christine know, please? Also in the live service, there will be the reading of the bands of marriages. They will be read for George Henry Booth and Emma Jane Strivens, both of this parish, both Thorpe St. Michael's. And so now to our call to worship. We have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, we have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. We have come to God, the judge of all men, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and of the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better world. Uh, sorry, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And that's based on a reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. And this is where we would come to our songs of praise and worship during our normal ser Sunday service. Uh, they are available on the website or versions of the songs are available on the website. So if you would like to stop this recording, Go back to the website, join in with those songs of praise and worship. And as you can see there, may our home be filled with dancing. Rest in your promise. And there must be more than this. Well, welcome back. And now to our confession. Shall we join in the words of the confession together? recognizing those times when we have fallen short of what God wants for us. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings and offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering away from your ways, in wasting your gifts and forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Amen. We know that if anyone sins, we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that he is the sacrifice for our sins. Amen. So to our offertory prayer. We read, they first gave themselves to the Lord, then gave of their substance. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own we have given you. Amen. And just before we start our next hymn and the uh, junior church leave us, shall we just pray for them and uh, their activities? Lord, you said, let the little children come to you. So we ask that you be with them, that they may truly know and learn from you. Amen. And again, this is where in the live service we'll be stopping to sing again, Is He Worthy? And now our reading. Our reading this week is taken from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. And there we read about Matthias, 
chosen to replace Judas. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together, constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everybody in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time. The Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justus and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen <clears throat> to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas let go when, where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I'm going to hand over to Mike Gibbs to come and bring us his reflection on our reading this morning. Mike, over, over to you now. Thank you, Mike. Although it's only a, a four letter advert, I'm sorry, adverb, when we hear the word then, we know that something is about to happen. And that something is almost certainly linked to an event that has just occurred. For instance, every episode of a soap opera starts with a metaphorical then because it is linked to the dramatic events that have concluded the previous episode. That's the way scriptwriters build suspense and lure us into the next chapter of the ongoing story. Quote, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. What dramatic event had preceded these opening words? The answer, of course, can be found in the phrase that illuminated our service last Sunday. Jesus ascends to heaven. We find ourselves caught up in the ongoing story that began with Lent, continued through Easter, and is now heading towards Pentecost. Then is a bridge between the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus and the establishment of his church. But first, let, let's go back a little, back to the previous episode, so to speak, to chapter one, verse eight, which I believe to be the key verse to the understanding of the entire book of the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus is making his closing remark in his final address to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Being Christ's witnesses is the mission of all who profess faith. We are called to witness to the word and to the inner reality that Christ lives in us through how we live. There's no kind of spare time job for us as Christians. It's our main task until Christ comes again. But we can't be the kind of witnesses we're called to be, and neither can any of the disciples, without the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, it's God's good purpose to give his spirit to his people so they can fulfill their calling. But before God pours out his spirit on the apostles and the other disciples, as described in Acts chapter 2, uh, the next enthralling episode in this drama, we see a dramatic change in their attitude. We see formerly headstrong, stubborn followers of Jesus now being submissive. This is an amazing change that can only have one explanation. Even before Pentecost, God's Holy Spirit was already at work in them. So in today's reading, we see three ways the disciples, or if you prefer, the apostles, demonstrate their newly God-given submissive attitudes. They submit to waiting, to scripture, and to God's choice. Firstly then, the apostles submitting to waiting. They've just witnessed the ascension of Christ on the Mount of Olives, which was Jesus' way of putting an exclamation mark, if you like, on his command to get busy witnessing to the world until he returns. So you would think, wouldn't you, filled with excitement, they'd get busy sharing the good news, but they don't. Acts 1 verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Instead of witnessing, they walk the half mile or so back to Jerusalem, which probably took less than 15 minutes. So why didn't they just immediately go out and start witnessing? Because they had specifically been told not to. Jesus had told them to wait. He did that in verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Now, this must have been very hard for a bunch of impulsive disciples, because Jesus had just given the greatest motivational speech of all time. And it was punctuated and concluded with his ascension. But he had also told them very clearly not to leave Jerusalem. So their immediate primary task was to be submissive to waiting, submissive to God's timing. Acts chapter 1, verse 18. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew. James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. It's interesting that scripture calls this the room. So maybe it's the very same upper room where they had met for the Passover. Who's there? Eleven of the twelve disciples. By the way, Judas, the son of James, isn't the same Judas that betrayed Christ. What were they doing? And who else was there? Let's look at Acts 1, verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Apparently, these women were so well known, most of them don't even need to be named. Most likely, they were Mary Magdalene, uh, Joanna, uh, the one the Bible calls the other Mary. Uh, perhaps some of the apostles' wives were present too. And Mary, Jesus' mother, is mentioned, but notice she isn't being worshipped. She needs a saviour, just like all the other Christians. 
Jesus' mother isn't being prayed to. She's praying along with the others. And Jesus' brothers are present. John chapter 7 verse 5 tells us that even his own brothers did not believe in him. So this is a big change for them as well. Matthew chapter 13 verse 55 tells us that Jesus had four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon and Judas. And they probably came to faith as a result of James seeing the resurrected Jesus. And now all of these people are together are submissively waiting for God's timing. Now, notice what they're doing while they wait. They are continually united in prayer. We can make some educated guesses, I suppose, about what they were praying for. Certainly they prayed for the coming of the Holy Spirit because Jesus had told them to just before his death in Luke. Um, 11 verse 13 he says this if you then though you are evil know how to give give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give the holy spirit to those who ask him so it's like, likely that they were asking for the holy spirit but it's good to remember too that the coming of the holy spirit wasn't dependent necessarily on prayer the purpose of their prayers and ours is to align our will with God's. We don't control God when we pray. God's not our, our genie in a bottle. We should ask for the Holy Spirit. But just like every time we pray, we primarily seek to submit ourselves to God's will in what is best described as expectant prayer. Remember what Jesus promised. In Luke 11, verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock on the door and it will be open to you. This is expectant prayer. Notice also in, in the verse that the emphasis is on continual prayer. They didn't just make a hobby of prayer. It was their primary task while they waited. Persistent, continual prayer is what they do. Or well, they submissively wait for God to act. Notice also that this submissive waiting and praying is done together. They aren't waiting for the Holy Spirit in isolation. They are now united in prayer. And this unity, you know, is amazing. Considering it hadn't been long since these same disciples were all arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You can read about that in Luke chapter 9, verse 30, 46. Now there is a change in them. Now they are submissive to God's will and willing to wait for his timing. Second point is the apostles submit to scripture. They know at this point more clearly than ever that the scriptures are all about Jesus because in the last 40 days, Christ has been teaching them. Jesus started on the day of his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, teaching two disciples that the Old Testament scriptures pointed to him. Then he appeared to all the disciples and told them, this is Luke 24, verses 44 and 45, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That opening of their minds also led them to understand the role that Judas had played in our unfolding drama. Peter told them, this is Acts 1 verse 16, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. Now they understand what Jesus meant when he prayed in John 17, verse 12, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now they understand that God had a purpose 
a sharing in ministry even for Judas. God didn't make Judas betray him, but Judas was a part of God's plan. Judas did exactly what he, Judas, wanted to do, but he also fulfilled prophecy. And here's how it was fulfilled in verse 18. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and there he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. That death is pretty disgusting. And so is Judas's betrayal. That's disgusting as well. All sin is disgusting, but in this case, it served God's good purposes and fulfilled prophecy. As Peter goes on to say in verse 20, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. With their newfound knowledge of scripture, the apostles know they need to find a replacement for Judas. So they submit to waiting and they submit to scripture and they submit to God's choice. Now, Peter has always been the dominant personality among the disciples. And in the past, he would probably have pushed very hard for his choice. But if he's learned anything over the last few days, it's that God's choice matters. And he also knew God would want certain qualifications. So he says in, in verse 21, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. There's a vacancy, but it can't be filled by just anybody. Notice the qualifications. They needed to be men who had been with Jesus since the beginning, and they needed to be eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus. But their last qualification implied is probably most important of all. They needed to be chosen by God. Listen for a moment to verses 23 to 25. So they nominated two men, Joseph called by Sabbath, also known as Justice, and Matthias, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Jesus left, which Judas left to go where he belongs. They could have voted, of course, but that would not have been, not really have emphasised that this was God's choice, and nor was it their traditional way of deciding things. Deciding by lot was common in the Old Testament, but this is the last time we see the method being used, so it's probably not meant to be a model for us. And the point really isn't the method being used, as much as their submission to who is actually deciding. The apostles were submitting to God's choice. Acts 1, verse 26. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. Notice that God's choice was accepted. There wasn't a call for a recount. No one complained. They submitted to God's will, and Matthias was added to the 11. What a change is taking place in these apostles. Once they were arrogant, self-centered, self-absorbed, just like us, but now they are submissive. They are submissive to God's command to wait. They are submissive to scripture and they are submissive to God's choice. They've been prepared and God is about to change the world through them. They are about to receive power like they have never known before, which will enable them to be Christ's witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When they were arrogant, they weren't ready. But in their submissive humility, now they are. So what about us? Are we submissive to God's agenda? Or are we still desiring the pursuit of our own? 
great power in the hands of self-absorbed people is dangerous. The names Hitler, Stalin, Putin, Trump even come to mind. So as we ask for God to give us more of his spirit, we should also be asking for God to help us to be submissive to his will. But it's not easy. It's not easy, is it? Corrie ten Boom, the great Dutch Christian, who became famous for her book, The Hiding Place, which recounts her family's efforts to save Jews during the Nazi Holocaust, and which led to their own imprisonment in concentration camps, was once asked if it was difficult for her to remain humble, as she became a world famous personality. And her reply was simple, but profound. And she said this, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey, and everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments on the road and singing praises, do you think that for one moment it ever entered the head of that donkey that any of that was for him? And she continued, if I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ, Christ rides in his glory, I give him all the praise and all the honour. Who do we want as Christians to get all the praise and honour? In today's passage, we saw evidence of a dramatic transformation taking place in the apostles. Their goal is no longer to make a name for themselves, but to make a name for Christ. That's all that matters to them. And my prayer today is that's all that matters to us as well. In the name of our risen and ascended Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I'm going to hand back to Mike. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for your word this and reflection this morning on our reading. And we come now to our prayers of intercession. And these are our responsive prayers. In response to, Lord, hear your mercy. Can you respond with, hear our prayer? Shall we pray? We pray for the war in the Ukraine, Lord. We ask for your peace and an end to the bloodshed. May the aggressor come to see the error of invasion. May he be moved to end the senseless and pointless killing especially of the civilians that they seem to be targeting. We ask the same peace and cessation of killing and violence in all parts of the world, where people feel they have the right to inflict their will on others, bringing about suffering on those they suppress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For political leaders everywhere, we pray that they may follow the example of the Good Shepherd in their care and concern for those who are entrusted into their care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Would we pray for those who suffer in any way? May God comfort them and his healing hand strengthen and protect them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For ourselves and all God's people, Lord, we ask that we may listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd in the stillness of our hearts and follow closely in his footsteps. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the departed. May they attain the fullness of life within the endless Easter festival of heaven. Those who have died recently and those whose anniversaries of death occur this week. Be with their friends and their family. On, and be their comfort and their strength at this time. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In a moment of silence now, Lord, we bring our own needs and concerns to our Heavenly Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, all these things we ask in expectation and in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we join together in the prayer our Lord and Saviour taught us? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And so we come now to our closing song. What grace is mine? You know, and you'll be familiar with the, with the tune. It's to the tune of Danny Boy, and it's by Keith and Kristen Getty. If you'd like to listen to that, if you want to stop this service recording and go back to the website, you'll find a link there to this particular song. Welcome back, and we move on now to our closing prayer and blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And if you're not able to be there on Sunday, please pray for the church as it meets together, as it finds what to do as we come out of the pandemic and out of the lockdown and all of the restrictions and how we can help rebuild our community and our connections within it. So please pray for the church meeting and all that will be discussed there. Thank you. Until we meet again, bye for now.